Welcome to DNA Unlocked, a special edition podcast series produced by the Scientists Creative Services team. This series is brought to you by Amgen, which is a pioneer in the science of using living cells to make biologic medicines. They helped invent the processes and tools that built the global biotech industry and have since reached millions of patients suffering from serious illnesses around the world with their medicines. In DNA Unlocked, Ray Deshays, Senior Vice President of Global Research at Amgen, explores the ever-evolving perception of human biology and disease processes thanks to a growing mountain of genetics and omics data. Through discussions with colleagues and other leading research experts, Deshays unpacks how drug developers decode human genetics to solve some of the most challenging diseases. Genomics is just one branch in the burgeoning field of science informally known as omics. The data points flowing from various branches of omics can be pieced together to build a sharper picture of how disease takes root and develops. The technology has the potential to deliver new biomarkers for earlier diagnosis of disease, faster and more successful clinical trials, and the ability to predict and prevent disease before it gains a foothold and becomes more grievous and costly. In this episode, I talked to Larry Gold, founder of Somalogic, a company with technology that provides more coverage of the proteome than any other existing platform. This technology is based on aptamers, nucleic acid molecules that bind to precise targets. Prior to Somalogic, Larry founded and was chairman of Nexigen, which later became Nexstar Pharmaceuticals. Hi, Larry. It's really a pleasure to be with you here today to talk about proteomics and other omics technologies. It's such an opportunity to be able to interact on this topic with somebody who has such a long history in this field, almost half a century of really thinking through what kind of technologies we could use to measure proteins at large scale in humans and other organisms to, to really understand biology. I'd like to uh, launch with just a simple analogy that I've used when talking about this. You could think about human genetics as the blueprint for a house. It tells you what the final structure is going to look like in a general way, although there's a lot of details that you might not see looking at that blueprint. And it sort of reveals what the potential for the structure is. If you have all the utilities and the drains and the water supply on one side, that's where your kitchen is going to go. And your bathroom is probably near that. And on the other side of the house, there's no utilities. That's probably where your living spaces and bedroom are going to go. You're sort of hemmed in by those architectural design features. Proteomics is more like the house after somebody has moved in and occupied it. There's all these things that are changeable. As somebody moves out and another person moves in, they change the furniture. They might paint the walls a different color. They might put up drapes here or take drapes down there, put blinds up. All various types of changes on the inside of the house can occur within that architecture that's specified by the blueprint. It's similar with proteomics and genetics, right? The genetics tells you what the potential is for that human, but the proteomics tells you what the state is right now, and that state can change over time. So with that introduction, what is it about this field of proteomics that excited you so much that you've been thinking about it for 45 years? I was a postdoc in Geneva, Switzerland, and I was studying a virus, bacteriophage T4. I wanted to follow that infection by watching all the proteins come up and down. So the standard experiment was just label the radioactive amino acids, uh, T4 infected E. coli, and then take samples every minute or every whatever you wanted and run a Lemley. And I was one of the first people ever to use Lemley gels. You could only really see 40 or 50 bands of proteins, and they were pretty distinct, even though the DNA of this bacteriophage is small and only has a couple hundred genes. You could watch things come up, and I became enamored by the limited and small proteome from this little uh, bacterial virus. The next step 
was Pat O'Farrell, was a, a graduate student, and his PhD mentor was not given tenure. So he was a graduate student without a lab and without a mentor. We got an NSF grant to give the money to him because he had had this idea that he could improve the resolution of proteomics by running 2D gels. He did this remarkable thing that expanded how many spots you could see to, uh, oh, I don't know, 1,500 or so in his 1975 paper. I was there when this expansion happened. And then there were companies that tried to use 2D gels to do exactly what is now called proteomics. And it was hard. We invented aptamers uh, in our lab that are now, it's known not to have been invented by us. It was invented by evolution. Aptamers are all over the place, natural ones. We invented this way to from a library of 10 of the 15 molecules, find the winners, the things that bound tightly and uh, specifically to a a protein with remarkable uh, affinities. And I woke up one day, and I realized we could use aptamers to do proteomics. We could do a really thorough job on proteomics. So this idea of watching things go up and down is pretty simple as an idea. You can't do for the genome because the genome doesn't go up and down. But it's hard to, to use the DNA to be a dynamic quantification of what's going on in biology. We decided we were going to do that. I've been doing it. It's true forever. I love it. A gel, it's about the size of half a sheet of paper. And when you run the proteins out on it, they separate out into bands. And it looks like almost like a UPC code that you see on everything that you buy in a store. You could only maybe get 40 to 50. You're not going to get over 100. That's for sure. uh, Of these lines that you could separately see where each line is a different protein. And the problem is the genome has about 22,000 genes. There may be as many as 10,000 different proteins in any one cell. So even if you're the best person at running gels in the world, you're still only seeing 100 out of 10,000, which is 1%. That was the need for better technologies, to see the other 99%. Maybe by separating in two dimensions instead of one, you could now see a few hundred, maybe three, four hundred, five hundred at the most. There's still the 95% that you're not seeing. What Larry's talking about with the aftermers, imagine you have a lake and the lake has 5,000 or 10,000 different species of fish in it, and you literally have 10,000 different baits. Each bait is one that is particularly loved by one of those species of fish, and you have 10,000 different fishing poles, each with a different bait attached to it, and now you go fishing in that lake, and you see what you pull up, and that tells you what fish were in the lake. There might be 5,000 species of fish, but it could be that trout account for 99% of the fish because even though it's only one of the 5,000 species, there may be a huge surplus of trout over the other 4,999 species. It's important not just to know how many species there are, but how many of each species there is. So Larry, you brought us up through the invention of the aptamer technology what have been the advances say in the past decade that have really put this into hyperdrive the first paper that we ever published on broad proteomics uh, was about 10 or 11 years ago Uh, we wanted to use these funny reagents the aptamer things are made out of nucleic acids not proteins so this is already kind of a shock even for me i have to say a, a wonderful surprise for us people who worked at, at uh, Nexstar and Sovologic. The progress really has been f- a few things that have all worked well. One is we got better at making these reagents. These are the 10,000 different baits that you described for the 10,000 fish. There's been a, an improvement in the selection of these bait molecules to make them better meaning higher and higher affinity and higher and higher specificity. 
So there's been lots of samples run on what we call big plexus, lots of human samples, tissue, urine, plasma, serum, whole blood, lots of things have been run on these multiplex things. The most interesting part is that you can't read your way to the proteome you care about. The literature doesn't let you do that. And the last 10 years of running 500,000 samples or so on various size versions of this proteomic array has made that completely clear. When you think you know what you're looking for, it turns out not to be there often, turns out not to change as you expect in a disease. The literature is often wrong because the literature was about 10 measurements, 10 people. There are many new proteomic things coming online, and they're all going to be very, very data heavy. One thing that you've been doing is looking at around 5,000 proteins in the blood and determining what their amounts are. You could imagine also looking at messenger RNAs in the blood. We know that they end up in exosomes, these little soap bubbles that travel around in the blood, and you could collect those exosomes, measure their mRNA. That would be another way of estimating what is the genome actually producing at any given point in time. Just to extend the prior analogy, looking at the proteome would be like looking at the 5,000 species of fish in the lake. Looking at the exosomal mRNA would be the equivalent of doing the same thing, but instead by looking for fish eggs in the lake, how many eggs you could find for the different species of fish. Uh, do you see that as a plausible approach? Do you see it as competing, as complementary? I hope it turns out to be complementary, but it's very difficult to go from mRNA levels to protein levels. The fundamental question is, for an mRNA, what is the correlation between its concentration and the concentration of the protein that is made by that mRNA? That's the question. We know examples from our data where an mRNA doesn't change at all, no, no change in the concentration, and the protein level either goes up or down tenfold. Yikes. So it's hard to do that. I think for the value of omics in healthcare, not only do you need technologies that are powerful, uh, proteomics being one of them, lipid, uh, you know, metabolomics is probably another uh, that is, has that kind of systemic quality to it, but you got to get the cost down so that you can afford to do this in the healthcare system. My dream for proteomics is that we end up with a technology that is a proteomics-centric wearable. So you could have data whenever you wanted and, and not worry about the cost and not worry about the samples and not worry about anything. You can't transform healthcare with proteomics unless you make it as regular as you possibly can, and that's about cost. The last time I went to the doctor, he sent me to the phlebotomist, and the phlebotomist drew blood, and they measured what I counted to be 10 different proteins in my blood. That included PSA, which uh, reveals my risk of prostate cancer, included hemoglobin A1C, which determines if I'm pre-diabetic or not, uh, it measured liver enzymes because a number of conditions can lead to liver damage, and then they spill their enzymes out into the blood. When you think about the future of the sort of technology you're involved with now, the proteomic technology, do you imagine that it is going to lead to more diagnostic protein. So instead of 10, maybe it'll, it'll be like 30 or 40 or 50. Then those will be incorporated into standard panels like now. Or do you imagine that the routine approach is going to be to use these chip type technologies and measure all 10,000 proteins, irrespective of whether they've been linked to any disease or not. What's going to become the standard when I go to get my blood work done? My dream, and it can't be done today because of cost mostly, would be that you always measure everything. You're providing more information into the healthcare system from the full proteome, not the panel. Now, 
that is not a widely shared driver for many people. It is for me. I think that there will be so many surprises in biology that since the technology is there, except for cause, really, you'd be crazy to not take advantage of the full thing that you can do. We face a cost question, I think, more than anything else. You have a little problem about where you want the sample to come from. The guess for a long time has been blood, plasma or serum. I'm a big fan of urine. They're now creeping into the, the discussion, many experiments, including some we've done, that urine is remarkably good. Protein concentrations are lower, but they're all there. And they go up and down with disease, just like they do in blood. So you could solve the phlebotomist problem. I made a picture of this in uh, the year 2000 and showed it to DARPA. It was a urinal, and it had a chip. Well, and there was a chip, you know, in the, the toilet. The idea was that was the way you got to constant monitoring. It's not a wearable but I don't see an easy way to get to a wearable for proteomics. You're not going to put a mass spec machine on your wrist for sure. I see your point about a wearable, but can you see your way to what in Star Trek was called the tricorder, which is it's bigger than a wearable. It's more like the size of a purse. Um, it's not like everybody in Star Trek had a tricorder. The doctor had a tricorder. You would go to your doctor and they could either draw blood or have you come back with some urine and they could stick it in the tricorder and the tricorder would have a mini device for using aptamers to measure proteins in blood. Do you see the technology ever scaling to that level where it's handheld, it's in a doctor's office or Will this be the province of the clinical chemistry laboratories? I see this as being in your house, in your toilet, so-called smart toilets, measuring stuff where the data goes from your toilet as you are ready to flush this up in the cloud. Or, and you get bioinformatics and algorithms saying to you, you're fine. You're just as good as you were three hours ago. It will feel like a wearable I like toilets better than an office. I like things that don't require phlebotomists, and I like things that are cheap, and I like things that are home. The technologies that are coming, they lead right there. I think it's going to happen. It'll take 10 years. It's not going to take three minutes. I mean, this is real biochemistry and real science. How do you see that vision integrating with genetic information? So, as all this proteomics is going on, we're also advancing sequencing technology. And I have a family member who came down with cancer recently. And the first thing that happened is the genome of the cancer cell was sequenced. Pretty soon, we'll be sequencing the genome of, of everybody, whether they have cancer or not. How do you see that information integrating with the proteome information? You would be crazy to not include genomics in the analysis you do on a person. We're all gonna be sequenced. You only gotta do it once by and large. From that sequence, there will be choices made that are relevant to that person's care. Drugs will be used that are smart for that person. If you do the proteomes of human tumors, where the mutation driving the tumor is identical, you can have tumors whose proteomes are very different. Every tumor is its own independent evolutionary trajectory from whatever mutation got it started. The proteomes are different. You wouldn't treat those people necessarily identically. The mutation that is the driver leads you to a great drug that works on that mutation. That's a, a special case, but I think it will be a general case that driver mutations will lead to very different tumor-specific proteomes. So I think these things are going to go together. You're not going to get away with, I mean, just the sheer power of genomics. Ten years from now, we'll know how to integrate the, those two things together. The dream is that proteomics and genomics will integrate in a good way. Genomics 
will largely be one and done, except for cancers, I guess. Um, and proteomics will be the opposite of one and done. It'll be longitudinal, be regular, and you will be the control for yourself as your proteome changes over time and with new diseases and their trajectories. I'm a believer in the mystery of time and of evolution. So I think the proteome is bound to change in ways that will shock us. We have an example of a piece of tissue identified by an incredible scientist, an MD scientist from Denver, whose name is Scott Fauci. We collaborate with him. He's worked for 30 years on pain that results from traumatic spinal cord injury. Pain below the injury, like phantom pain for amputees. But this is from spinal cord being crushed or severed. And pain is experienced by these people that is unremitting. It's enormously painful. And he's a surgeon who stabilizes those patients at Craig Hospital in Denver. He identified, believe it or not, through 30 years of work, the place below the break where the pain is originating. Patients who were in pain let him operate and remove it, resect it, or cauterize it, and the pain goes away. This is an amazing result. Then we did the proteomes for him. We just took that tissue, ground it up, and did the measurements we do, and we took some tissue next door that was not pain-causing. It turns out that there were proteomic differences, and some of the proteins that were elevated in Scott's work had drugs already aimed at them for different things. And so he tried on five patients that he was going to operate on. Instead of operating and cauterizing, he just treated them with an off-label use of the drug. It worked. Holy moly. So that sort of thing, that's not a genomic question. I think that's going to happen over and over and over. That raises actually an interesting fundamental science question, which is, you do the proteomics, you measure thousands of proteins, and you're always going to see changes, right? And some of those changes may be causal, like in this case it appears to be, but many of those changes are going to be effects. How do you deal with that question? This is the difference between causation and correlation. For example, if after a heart attack, muscle proteins leak out into the blood, that's a result of a heart attack. It's not the target for a drug. That's correlation, not causation. In Scott's case, he knew that pain could be alleviated by ablation, by resection, or by cauterization. You have to have an insight. And in, in Scott's case, the insight was easy because when he took that tissue out, people stopped feeling pain. So you knew you had found causality. But most of these things, whether it's transcriptomics or or metabolomics or proteomics, you don't have that clue. And so you're trying to read your way to that clue. You're trying to use the literature. The literature is not your friend in these situations. The big issue will be for all diseases, you need something that drives you to think you found causality. A genetic clue, a disease that comes because of a mutation, is pretty close to causality. What you're saying uh, effectively is that the sort of fundamental mechanistic biology that you and I have done for many, many years in our academic laboratories, that's not going to go out of style. The omics gives you a lot of data, but to sort out a change that is causal versus a change that is a consequence of disease, it requires really doing mechanistic biology and, and digging deep and to understand the significance of the changes that are being seen. Well, Larry, this has been just a phenomenal conversation. Thank you for sharing your insights with us. This has been such a pleasure for me. I look forward to the next time we have an opportunity to chat like this. Thank you, Ray. It was wonderful. Thank you for listening to DNA Unlocked. And thanks again to Larry Gold, founder of Soma Logic. To dive further into this topic, 
please join Amgen scientists at the DNA Unlocked Q&A webinar discussion on September 8th. Register for the event at the link provided in the episode notes. While genomics provides insights into a person's DNA, these data are only a portion of the whole story. In the next episode of DNA Unlocked, we will unlock the genetics of cancer from the bench to the bedside with Angela Coxon, Vice President of Oncology Research at Amgen. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to The Scientist's Lab Talk wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast contains forward-looking statements that are based on the current expectations and beliefs of Amgen. All statements other than statements of historical fact are statements that could be deemed forward-looking statements, including any statements around the potential science and innovation of genetics and drug discovery. Forward-looking statements involve significant risks and uncertainties, including those described in the Securities and Exchange Commission reports filed by Amgen, including our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and any subsequent periodic reports on Form 10-Q and current reports on Form 8-K. Unless otherwise noted, Amgen is providing this information as of the date of this podcast and does not undertake any obligation to update any forward-looking statements contained in this podcast as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. No forward-looking statement can be guaranteed, and actual results may differ materially from those we project.